Hey, it's great to have you back for another episode of the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast, where we're deeply passionate about building leaders because we say it all the time and we know it's true. Everyone wins when the leader gets better. If you're just joining us, we release a new teaching on the first Thursday of each month. In next month's episode, we're going to revisit one of the most commonly asked questions. People ask, how do I lead up? How do I make a difference? How do I lead my leaders and influence others from where I sit in the organization? We're going to revisit that on the first Thursday of next month. Now, today, we've got a very special guest for you. As you might know, I'm honored to serve at the Global Leadership Network, and I speak every year at the Global Leadership Summit. At this year's summit, a few months back, I got to interview my good friend, Paula Ferris, for the Global Leadership Summit podcast. And I want to give a special thanks for the Global Leadership Network for letting us share this one with our community. You may know Paula as the co-host and keynote speaker for the Global Leadership Summit, or from her extensive broadcasting career, Paula is brilliant. She was the co-anchor of Good Morning America Weekend and the co-host of The View. She also hosts the Journey of Faith podcast, and she's got a new book out. It's an amazing book. It's called Called Out, and it looks at the differences between career and calling. Let's now go to an interview with Paula Ferris. This is the Craig Groeschel Leadership Podcast. For those of uh, people in the audience that may not be completely familiar with your broadcasting career, I want to give them the chance just to get to know you a little bit. Can you tell us some of the highlights about your career and maybe Mm -hmm. people that you've interviewed? Sure. It's funny when it it depends on who asks me, like, what's your favorite all-time interview? And if they know that I'm a huge sports geek, I mean, I cut my teeth in broadcasting, working in small markets. It's like the coaching path. If you're a coach, you work your way up through peewee leagues and then junior high and then high school and college. And then the pinnacle is the NFL. So in television, you work your way up working in smaller markets. And then for me, I worked in Dayton, Ohio, and then Cincinnati, Ohio, Chicago. And then I get called to work for the network ABC at the end of 2011. So when people ask me this, if they'd know that I'm a sports fan, which I am, I covered sports for 10 years. My favorite all-time interview was Bo Schembechler. And people are like, who? But I, I'm, I'm born and raised in Michigan. Um, if you're a sports fan, you know who Bo Schembechler is. I mean, he's a famous coach. And in Michigan, he's like, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And then there's Bo Schembechler. So he's revered. And, you know, my whole family went to the University of Michigan. So for me, that was my all-time personal favorite because of the meaning that that interview uh, meant, the meaning that that interview carried. And that was early on in my career when I was working in Cincinnati. But I think some of the more memorable ones since I've been at the network, since I've been at ABC, were interviewing the cast of Avengers, interviewing the cast of Star Wars, interviewing Tom Hanks most recently about a year ago. And I just got to a little glimpse into who Tom Hanks is, is it, it the character of Tom Hanks? We are, we're doing this interview, Craig, and I don't know if when you've conducted interviews, if like there's been a lot of noise or distraction around you. Well, we're conducting this interview at Disneyland, just outside of Toy Story Land, because it's an advance of Toy Story 4. So we're, we're on the premises. You can see some of the roller coasters behind us. We have, um, Disney has set up the interview space, but you know, people are yelling at him, hey, Tom. And then it's starts to rain. And I'm not talking to sprinkle, I'm talking pouring. And Tom Hanks is, I mean, he is a celebrity. He's a, he's in a class all by himself. And, you know, at any point he could have said, and I'm too big for this, but he, I I have such respect for him and how he handled the interview. He morphed into his character from Castaway and he's catching the water in his hand and, you know, joking about Wilson, the volleyball. And he's just a class act. And the way he handled that really like was a true test of his character. So that's one of my all-time favorites. So I'm curious, before you interview somebody, like was, was there one person you were maybe most nervous before the interview? Oh gosh, that's a, I, I always get a little nervous before interviews because it's so important to make your guest feel comfortable right out of the gate. Because I mean, if the first couple of minutes bomb, then the whole interview is going to bomb. So, so did, I, did I make you feel comfortable? I am totally at ease because you're a champion right? That's the very reason. But here's the key. (laughs) Here's the key when, uh, for me, 
I want them to know that I care and yep. that I've done my research. Mm -hmm. And once you make them comfortable and and they realize that that you care enough to do the research on mm -hmm. them, then they start opening up to you and maybe mm -hmm. revealing a little too much. So if I've done my research, yes. then I would know that you wrote a little bit about fear. What are you talking about? Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and I, 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 I'm excited to talk about this because I think every leader has to face significant fears. And, Absolutely. And if I did my research, then I would know that you wrote about you being afraid that, that there's a time fear could kill your career. Oh, absolutely. I think fear for me paralyzed me at several points in my life and it continues to plague me. I, I think that's the fallacy about fear is that one day we'll be cured of it or we'll just conquer it and we'll never have to deal with it again. Once I finally understood that this was something I was going to face the rest of my life, it normalized it for me. And then it empowered me to believe that it's up to me to press into it. And guess what? Everyone experiences fear. Fear paralyzed me from even getting into broadcasting to begin with. I didn't think that I would have what it took, Craig. And it wasn't until 9-11 happened where I was really able to see the dream for me that other people had seen for me first, to my college professors and my high school teacher. I didn't think I could do it. And then when I'm at the top of my game, you know, anchoring Good Morning America Weekend Edition, co-hosting The View, totally addicted to my job, personal low, professional high. What good is it for a man to game the world but to lose his soul? One of those situations. It was the fear of failure, the fear of what people would think if I walked away at the height of my career. So for me, just realizing that fear is going to be present and that it's normal and that it can be really scary um, has just emboldened me to press into it even more when I have a peace about the situation, knowing that peace and fear can coexist. There's a lot of power in all that you just said. And, Thank and, you. And you know, for me, as, as an, a, a fellow leader, I find that uh, what you said, that, that you, you normalize it, is that really, it kind of speaks to my soul because I'm kind of growing to the place where I'm just comfortable with it, mm -hmm. and but I've never put it in that kind of language. And uh, I think that's I think there are probably a lot of people right now that might be afraid to take a step of faith, might be afraid to start something, have a difficult conversation, Absolutely. get out of their comfort zone. And I think it would be really wise just to kind of internalize what Paul was talking about in your own leadership and say, it's I'm gonna, I, I need to learn to be comfortable living in it, and that Absolutely. peace and fear can can coexist. I want to talk about the calling because you seem to be, you seem to walk with this confidence that's bigger than just in your own gifts, but like there's, there's, a, there's more behind it. But what bothers me a little bit about is you push back on people like me, who's a pastor. <laughs> And the book's called Called Out. I call myself I know, out. I call I know, other like, people. Oh, come on, Paula. I'm an Enneagram like, 8. I can't help myself. I get in my own way. Yeah, and I'm eights so are hard to deal with. You get, you're so rebellious. You're terrible human beings. You've got to make your point. And so <laughs> you, you say that people like me and I'm people sorry. of faith sometimes make a mistake in trying to inspire people to find their calling. What, what, do we, what, what do we do wrong, Paula? I, I don't know if it's a mistake, but, but okay, so... Here's what it is. I, you know, when I walked away from these two dream jobs, I had a full out identity crisis, Craig. I didn't know who I was outside of it. And I think for me and for so many of us in society, we're doing what society tells us to, to, to lean in. Um, the society asks us our name and what do you do for a living? And it's as if that's the only thing we bring to the table. Uh, we ask our kids from the time they can talk. What do you want to do and what do you want to be when you grow up? And then we get these messages in church and we're told to find that one thing that we were created to do. And for me, I thought I had, that I was here to be a broadcaster. When that shifted, I didn't know who I was outside of it. So in some senses, I think we need to contextualize calling because calling isn't just career. So let's contextualize. When we say find your calling, we're always saying career as if mm -hmm. We're insinuating that they're synonymous as if that's the only thing we're here for. But I mean, if you want to bring faith into the equation, Jesus talked about his purpose in John 12, 27, I think it is that I come to fulfill my purpose. And that is to offer myself as a sacrifice. But so often in the churches, we're told to find our purpose and our calling. And it's always related to career. All instead of finding out who we are outside of the doing and who we are outside of what we do. I didn't know who I was outside of what I did. Mm -hmm. I... I was doing what society and what church told me to do, mm -hmm. to do this one thing, the 
to the best of my ability. And I did, and I burnt out and it was at the expense of everything that I had professed to be of value to me. And so my thing is, I'm not angry at the church at all, but I just, I, I think that we need to do a better job of contextualizing calling. Cause when I fell flat on my face and realized, I don't know who I am outside of this job. It's not enough to be a wife and a mom and a child of God and blah, 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 all the things we say define us. It wasn't enough. So I felt like in that moment, God really revealed that we have these two callings on our life. And let's just contextualize it. We have a faith calling, which is your purpose. And that's unmovable, unshakable. That's never going to change. It's who you are. It's not, has nothing to do with what you do. And then you have a vocational calling and vocational calling can and will change. Unlike faith calling, which doesn't change. Vocational calling is just the vehicle by which you're going to fulfill your purpose. For me, I had to realize my faith calling is who I am. It's why I'm on this earth and it's to love God and love people. It's not to be the best broadcaster. That's what I thought it was. And you notice when that shifted, when my vocation shifted, so did my identity. So did the who am I? So finding out who I am outside of what I do, accepting that vocation can change, vocational calling can and will change. God can call us to different things in different seasons. I feel like God's calling me vocationally into a season where I need to raise my kids. I've had nannies and au pairs for 12 years since my oldest daughter was born. And I really feel God's calling me into a season where I need to learn how to be a mother and and stop passing the buck. And and I wanna clear my plate and then I want to bring things into the fold that I'm passionate about. But God calls us to different things vocationally in different seasons. We can offer and we can try new things, but it all has to be rooted in knowing who we are outside of what we do. So I know who I am. I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I love Jesus, I'm curious, I ask lots of questions and I champion and challenge people. That's who I am, okay? Notice that has nothing to do with the execution of it. That's not gonna change. That didn't change when I went through, uh, you know, personal crisis a couple of years ago. It didn't change, that, that, that purpose statement hasn't changed in this pandemic, okay? It's not, it's not gonna rock my foundation, my who I am. So I just needed to learn who I was outside of what I did. And so often we misplace our significance in things that shift and shake, like status, like job, like bank account. And when we do, when we find our purpose and identity in that, we're not gonna know who we are. Yeah, I wanna ask you more about that in a minute, but I, I need to just kind of park there. And I think there's so much richness in what you said, because I, I think you're right. in especially in the ministry world, we can, with good intentions, Absolutely. Try to, try to make calling look more as like a vo- vocation. And in fact, uh, was actually um, interestingly enough, just teaching on the subject recently. And one of the things I was really trying to help our spiritual leaders understand is the way I said it is similar. To what you're saying is that calling is a who before a do. Mm, that's good. And, and the, the, and it really is that you get, like you said, your vocation can change and it, and it most likely and it will. will. That's the thing. It will. it will change. Yes. It will change too. The, the other thing that I think just from a spiritual perspective, and I know we have a, um, in our audience right now, people from all different faith ba- backgrounds Absolutely. and we're super honored that they would listen. And so I don't want to take this too far, but I do think it's important for people to recognize too, that there's not a hard line between like a secular vocation and a ministry calling. Mm-hmm. In, in, in my view, this sometimes I think we in more of the spiritual world can undervalue the, um, a, just a, a job, meaning that can be a ministry wherever 100%. you are. hundred percent. hundred percent. It can be. Absolutely. You don't have to have a ministry title whatsoever. In fact, I would really encourage people to do more of what you did. And in fact, we were talking before this, I was encouraging you to continue to let your influence be big and broad mm-hmm. because there's so much power there. And so if there's anybody maybe listening right now that feels inferior, meaning like I wish what I was doing was more spiritual, that's just, it's just a lie. It's absolutely a lie. I went to a Christian college and we were told if we wanted to minister, we had to work in ministry. But I believe the Bible talks about being a light in a dark place. So yes. you light you shines in the darkness. You certainly did ministry at The View, right? <laughs> and you'll do ministry, you'll do ministry wherever you are because of who you are. Well, and we all will. We yes. all will. Where We can all be used where we're placed and lead where we are. Whatever you believe your purpose on this earth is, the vocation is where you are. That's just the, the conduit by which you're going to fulfill that. And that it's just that little small paradigm shift. So it becomes less about what you're doing and, and where you are and why you're doing it. 
Well, you've done so much. You've accomplished a lot. And in many ways, you've got to be proud of that. In some ways, it kind of, it sounds like it kind of took over in your life. Like oh, some it was people. an addiction. And I think, I think this is what you call it, the drug of success. Mm-hmm. Probably a lot of people can, <laughs> with really good intentions, push and drive and then end up a slave or addicted to something. Can you, can you kind of unpack yeah. that even more than what you wrote about? What, what does it mean to you to be addicted to the, to the drug of success? Well, I said I was, my work was my narcotic of choice because I couldn't get enough of it. And that was the one thing that really fulfilled me. It, it wasn't enough. I, I, had, you know, I have three beautiful kids. I have a husband who I've been married to almost 20 years. I, a woman of faith, wonderful family, friends, and church. But the job became the place that filled my bucket. It's what made me feel good about myself. And it became more about the accolade and the achievement and the accomplishment and the spotlight. And I was burnt out, but not everybody that burns out hates what they do. I, I was burned out because I looked around and my relationships were in the toilet with my husband and my kids and my health was suffering. The things that I professed to be of value to me were totally clashing with the choices that I was making. And um, I think I just, I still loved it. And people ask me to this day, like, do you miss it? And I'm like, well, an addict always misses a hit you know, their drug of choice. I miss being that it girl. I do in a moment of honesty, but I know that that's not where I'm supposed to be. I know that I was called out of a space where I was totally addicted to the job, addicted to the success, doing it for the wrong reasons. And I, that's where the struggle I had to realize that I was, didn't know who I, I felt like I was nobody without it. And I think for people that might be feeling like they're sacrificing a lot. I I mean, I think there's always sacrifice involved, yes. But um, do you know who you are outside of it? Um, You know, ask yourself, um, you know, am I finding significance from things that are, that can shift, like my job? Am I finding too much significance? Ask yourself, are the things that are of value to me, whatever they are, whatever you may define them to be, are they clashing with the choices that I'm actually making? And I think, if you answer yes to that, then you need to do some soul searching. And for me, it wasn't enough that my life was falling apart, that I was at this professional high and personal low. I believe, and again, I'm unabashedly, you know, a, a Jesus follower. I believe that God called me out of that space through um, personal tragedies within seven months. And I write about it in the book. I had what I call a season of hell. I had a miscarriage with an emergency surgery. And then I had a concussion through a freak accident work. As um, I was getting ready to go live on Wall Street for Good Morning America and some kids threw an apple at my head 60 miles an hour. And that hurts. It's like taking a fastball to the head. Um, So I was knocked out of work for three weeks. And then the day I got cleared to go back, literally the day I got cleared to go back to work, I get in a head on car crash. And then I got influenza, which turned into pneumonia. And so sometimes I think we can assess our landscape and say, okay, my clashes are, or my choices are clashing, you know, with my values, Um, my relationships are in the tank and we can have the wisdom uh, and strength and courage to, to make a change. I was dumb. I was addicted. I was so addicted. I, I couldn't make the choice for myself. So I feel like God literally had to slow me down and extract me from the situation. So um, that's where I think tragedy and opportunity can coexist, just like peace and fear. I felt like um, amidst all of that tragedy, there was an opportunity for me to kind of reset and the trajectory for my life. Well, I just so appreciate your transparency. And I can just even imagine how many people are listening right now who might even be able to say almost those same words, like I'm right now professionally successful, but I'm failing at home. And Paul, I think one of the things, ways I tried to explain it is is like the, the difference between the values that you claim mm-hmm. and the life that you live often equals the pain that you experience. That's right. And I think you kind of, it sounds like, you know, maybe not even by choice, but just by getting hit in what you call the year from hell, Mm -hmm. kind of woke you up. Help me understand, how did you detox from the hit, the adrenaline, the fame, the attention, the drug of success? How how do you let that go and find your identity somewhere else? It was hard, first of all, to realize I'd gotten it all wrong. And then to, you know, swallow my pride and realize that what I had said was of value to me 
yeah, I was living a different way. But for me, how I, it, it took a long time. A, I had to admit that I was wrong. And then B, I, I really tried to surround myself by a really tight inner circle, listen to the right people. And, you know, I did that through a small group. And I think if you don't have a small group in your life, I'm not talking like not do not cast a wide net. I'm not even thinking 12 disciples. I'm thinking like three or four people that do life with you that know the good, bad and the ugly and have seen the warts and the rust and can speak life into you and can call you out when you need to be called out. Surrounding myself with with people of that caliber that I believe God can speak to you through and just listening to the right voices. And, you know, I it was a lot of introspection, a lot of just meditation and quiet. And, you know, what can be really tough with the transition and the reset is, you know, that you're supposed to make a move, but you don't know what's on the other side. And so often, like, I didn't know it was on the other side and I'm still kind of figuring it out. It's not like I, oh, here's the next chapter for you. So let's tidy this one up. I had no idea what was on the other side. And that's really scary. That can be really, really scary. But I had a peace in my spirit that I was supposed to do this. I was supposed to step away, even though I didn't really want to. And I knew it made no sense to anybody. I had a peace about it. And I knew that because I had a peace, I was going to press into my fear. And I was going to do what a lot of people might think would be a career killer, what I thought would be a career killer. So it's uh, it, it took a while. And I'm still learning. Um, I still don't know really the next chapter, but I think there's you know, there's something to be said for stepping out in faith, like Martin Luther King Jr. said, you know, even when you can't see the rest of the staircase, and sometimes it's hard to even see that stair that you're on, but it's part of life. It's part of living, you know, a faith-driven life. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that staying kind of on the path of success in many ways was easy because that's what you've known. That's what society conditions you to do. And doing a massive reset like you did probably feels like you were flying in the face of what is rational mm -hmm. at times. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I had an executive multiple times told me I'd be crazy to walk away. You know, I had so much equity. And I thought that too. I was like, I'm crazy. Like, I had a peace in my spirit that I was supposed to do this, but I, I even thought this is really crazy. This doesn't make any sense. And it didn't make a lot of sense to people. And, but it doesn't have to. What would you say to someone right now who is maybe listening to this and almost feeling nervous because it's hitting so close to home? And they I'm may- I'm sorry, they, that's what I would tell them. I'm yeah. so sorry. Well, they, they <laughs> may not be called to walk away from their right. career and do what you did, but they might be called to do something different. Mm -hmm. And different, scary, it's unknown. I mean, every day to you is more uncomfortable because you're plowing new ground. What advice would you have to someone who maybe they're waking up and realizing what I thought was success maybe isn't really the true meaning of success? Mm -hmm. Well, I think sometimes that can be the pivot in and of itself is just that paradigm shift is realizing what's important. And not everybody is called to make a huge dramatic shift like the one that I that the one that I did, the one that I chose for my life. But I felt unequivocally that that's what I was supposed to do. But sometimes it's just, a, it's, it's as simple as a paradigm shift. Um, you know, asking yourself, who are you outside of what you do? And if you can come up with a statement for that, finding the things about you that won't shift and shake in a pandemic and focusing on those things and then, you know, releasing yourself from the lie that this is your only value, this is your only worth, that career is, is your calling. And then giving yourself the permission I, I can branch out. I think that's a big thing is giving yourself permission to branch out and try new things. Realizing that it's not so much about what you do, it's why you're, why you're doing it and who you're doing it for. It's the motivation behind it. So sometimes it can be as simple as a paradigm shift. I imagine that along the way, you had a lot of people throwing more than just apples at your head. <laughs> um, you probably took a lot of hits from critics. How does calling help you sustain and endure all of the junk that goes along with success? I mean, it, for me, it was just, it changed the way that I look at life and it changed the way I look at my purpose on this earth. It changed the way that I look at vocation. And I don't think it's ever too late for a paradigm shift for, for, for me, a new perspective. And I, 
I know that as crazy as, as what I did was, I have no regrets about it. None. And I know that God, that I can be called to different things in different season and that seasons. And that for me is really freeing. And what I really hope is that I can empower people to do the same, to realize that their worth just, it doesn't just lie in doing. I want people to help people uncover their true unshakable purpose. That's not going to shift in a global crisis. And then help them grant themselves permission to branch out and try new things. I feel like the shackles are off kind of, you know, I feel like my Enneagram eight is like all up in herself and like ready to go and help champion other people. I applaud and admire so much just the the tenacity, hard work, determination, drive for you to succeed. And then the tenacity, determination, hard work, and faith to do a massive reset in your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, as one who's, you know, you've really risen to the top of your game and professionally, anyone in your industry would say you're one of the best of the best. And I know we have a lot of leaders right now that that is their goal in whatever they lead. They want to be the best of the best. If you could just kind of sit down and have coffee with them one-on-one and say, hey, I hope you become the best of the best, but here's what I really want you to know on the ride. What would you say to that that leader? Oh, that's such a good question. I just think, like, I try to make decisions based on my 70-year-old self. So, like, I try to envision, I, I, I call it this front porch mentality, okay? Well, first of all, I think it's okay to love what you do. Absolutely. I think you should love what you do, but don't allow it to define you if that's your identity. If you introduce yourself, I'm... Paula Ferris, I'm the broadcaster of Good Morning America. Like, that's identifying me. I'm misplacing my significance because that vocational shift is going to happen one day, right? And then I'm when that shift happens, I'm not going to know who I am. So know who you are outside of what you do. But how would my 70-year-old self make this decision, the one that I'm sitting in right now, my almost 45-year-old self, to have that foresight, that wisdom, almost prescient in some ways? But when I make big decisions. I try to envision myself that 70 year old woman loving life, but looking back, how would she have made this decision? Would she have made it? And sometimes for me, that's very clarifying. I don't want to think about my deathbed and how would I go out. No, I want like, I've still got a lot of vitality in me when I'm 70 years old. I still got a lot of life to live, but how would that, how would that your 70 year old version make this decision in this moment? That's so powerful. And what I know about you is there's, you're, you're so talented and you've got so much drive that professionally you're going to continue to find ways to make a big difference. But what I think is a great celebration is that personally you've found that you're hitting your sweet spot of success. And so I really hope that our, our audience can take that to heart. I want to just make sure they really know where they can hear more from you because it would be valuable. Your book is called Called Out. And you did call out me as a preacher and say we can do a better job. And I'm sorry, I, and I, I didn't think really mean to call you I out, but just right. like, can we shift the language a little I bit? Can think, we contextualize it a little bit? I think you should shift the language <laughs> and sit on your porch at 70 <laughs> and, and uh, drink your spiked lemonade and uh, and know that calling is a who before a do. And so, Paul, I want to thank you again for your contribution to the Global Leadership Summit and thank you for living out your calling. And it's been a blessing to us today. And so it's been an honor to have you on and I, I hope the uh, GLS audience will feel inspired and encouraged to explore a bigger vision for what God can do in their own lives. So, Paula, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, Craig. Appreciate it. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the discussion with Paula. Man, her passion is contagious. And I hope you bring some application now, and I know I have. A good question to ask yourself is this. Would your 70-year-old self be satisfied and proud of the decisions that you're making and the path that you're on? Great question. Ask yourself, would the 70 year old version of yourself really like the trajectory of your life? If not, guess what? You can do something about it today. Again, Paula's new book is out. It's called Called Out. You can find the leadership guide with detailed content on all of our episodes. Go to life.church slash leadership podcast. We have a new teaching coming out on the first Thursday of every month. If this is helpful to you, please share on social media. If you tag me and I see it, I might repost your post, write a review or rate it, and please hit subscribe wherever you consume the content. Hey, remember, we say it all the time, be yourself because people would rather follow a leader who's always real than one who's always right. 